from the Hard Rock Hotel in Las Vegas. It's the Cube covering HoshoCon 2018. Brought to you by Hosho. Okay, welcome back everyone. We're here live in Las Vegas for the first security blockchain conference. It's an inaugural event, HoshoCon, and it's all about the top brains in the industry coming together with experience and tech chops to figure out the future in security. I'm John Furrier, the host of theCUBE, and next guest, Andre McGregor, who's the partner and head of global security for TLDR. Welcome to theCUBE, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. So you have a background, we're just talking off camera, FBI, you've been doing cyber uh, for a long time, cyber security, mostly enterprise grade, large scale, now we're in crypto, where you have small set of teams running massive scale with money involved. Correct. So guess what, money attracts. Right. People who want, it, want that money. A lot of hacks, 500 million dollars in Japan, plus 60 million over here. You add it all up, it's a billion so far this year, who knows what really the number is, it's pretty big. It is, and uh, what, what's concerning, and the reason why I came over in the space was, you know, the number of hacks that were happening. Uh, my company, we get probably a call a week, whether it's a high network individual, CEO, exchanges, we've helped a couple, some that you'd know of uh, if I told you who they were, uh, to kind of get out of a very bad situation. And uh, instant response has been big, but what we've learned is that it's the same old fraud, the same old security tactics that uh, are being used against some of these crypto companies. And, and we've seen all the time, everyone's had fraud alerts on their credit card. This is like classic blocking and tackling at a whole nother level. It is, because if you think about it from like a traditional startup, you have a company that's small, they have time to develop their MVP, they go out and they do a, maybe a seed round, friends and family, they're, they're sort of you know, ramping up over time, whereas we basically flipped the model upside down. These same you know, six founders now have $10 million, $10 million worth of crypto, and they're not protecting it in the ways that they think they should because they're in hyper growth mode. So the bad guys have, have determined that as a you know, great place to target, and now as we see in the news, it's actually happening. Yeah, and Hartej, um, the co-founder of Hosho, was just on talking about physical security and the sense of you got to watch out where you go too. Now it's not just you know, you know, online security; it's physical security. So startups have that kind of fast and loose kind of culture. Well, if you think about it, you know, traditional security in, in corporations, I can put everyone in a building, I have this, this you know, similar or same network egress points, I can protect those, I can do the gates, guards, guns, perimeters around, but I got people working from home now in, in the crypto space, you know, everyone's got their own setup. Um, you know, if, if someone's in an audience, they say, oh, I've been in the, the blockchain space since 2010 or 11, I can make assumptions about them, about their financial worth, and other people are doing the same, but yeah. having to pair You just connect the dots, okay, yeah. it was 22 cents in 2011, so therefore right. if they had kept a little bit of Bitcoin, they, they would be doing very well, they're and therefore they're a target now. So when you think about it, you, you yeah. put all those scams together, it becomes sort of a yeah. you know, hot topic for... I just got into, I just got into crypto. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. All right, so let's talk about the security hack because obviously, you know, um, in the enterprise tech, we cover a lot of those events across the year. IoT edge is a huge topic. Cloud computing booming. So you now you have a lot of compute, which is good and for and for bad actors too. So you have now a surface area that's now no perimeter. There's no egress points to manage. Is there a digital way to kind of map this out and blo does blockchain give us any advantages or anything on the horizon that you see where we can, in digital form? Well, I mean, uh, the, the, the true reason I came into the blockchain space, having worked hundreds of victim notifications and you know, several dozen actual intrusions from you know, large intrusions at banks that you know, are, are top five in the world, all the way down to, to small clear defense contractors, you realize it's always a server you didn't know about, credentials that had more access than they should, obviously getting access to a centralized server that then gets exposed and allows that data to be leaked out. So the idea of blockchain and being able to decentralize, distribute that data, own it, and, crypt, and keep it cryptographically pure, um, and also being able to uh, essentially remove the single source of failure that we saw in a lot of these uh, hacks is exciting. Um, you know, obviously blockchain is also not the answer to everything. So yeah. in some ways, the spreadsheet is still a spreadsheet, and the MongoDB yeah. will still be the MongoDB. The post but, next to your computer, your <laughs> private key on it. <laughs> but at the same point in time, you know, it all comes down to you know, cyber hygiene, right? I mean, the, yeah. the stuff that we're looking at, the hacks that we're seeing, the hacks that I'm dealing with and my company dealing with day in, day out, are not sophisticated. They may be sophisticated actors, but they're using unsophisticated means, and of course, 
I hate to harp on it, but email is still the number one intrusion vector. We all have it, we all use it. Yep. You can take stats from the FBI that says 92%, you can take stats from Verizon that says 93%, yep. but that and will still be the And phishing is the, the classic attack point. It will always be, because I can, easy. I'm, I can <laughs> manipulate people, I, I find the right opportunity. Um, I, I always say, I've, I, even I've been, fi been fished, um, it, it happens, it, right, you know, the way yeah. your mind is, you just how you react is, the, is, is what we need to teach people. It's really clicking on that one thing that, that just takes one time. Yep. Yeah. A PDF that you think is a document from work, or a potentially job opportunity, or a new thing, sports scores, your favorite team, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, I mean, you don't know. But, I'm going to challenge you on this, you get, you click on that bad link, or you, you feel like your computer's been hacked, who do you call? Do you actually you know, have someone that you can call? There's no cyber 911, uh, unless you are a high net worth individual or, or, or being targeted by a nation state, you're not calling the FBI. Um, so who do you call? And, and that's the problem that we have in our industry right now. And I mean, I, I guess uh, I, I've been the person that people have been calling, which is fine, I want to help them. Uh, 12 years as a firefighter, on top of my FBI yeah. career, I'm used to helping people in, in, in time of need. But really, the, in the grand scheme of things, there's not you know, enough Mandians or Verizons yeah, yeah. or too big. So for these smaller six person companies that don't have yeah. $500,000 to spend on incident response, they actually have no one to call when they actually do click something bad. And, and, and the people they pension to call, that aren't actually there to help them. Sometimes they get honey potted into another vector, sure. which is, hey, I can help you. Or I even challenge it a bit further. You call any of these companies when your phone has been hacked, you SIM swap, whatever it is, and you need to sign a master services agreement. You need to go through all the uh, legalese. Well, you're actively being hacked. Like, it's happening hour after hour, and you're seeing it. Your, yeah. your accounts are being compromised and being taken over, and you're trying to find outside counsel to do red lines. So, uh, in, in emergency services, we say, don't exchange business cards at the disaster site. It's not the time that you should be saying, hi, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, introducing myself. We should figure out all the retainers, instant response, you know, legal questions beforehand so that at two o'clock in the morning, someone calls and you have someone pick up the phone. Yeah, and you know what the costs are going to be because it's solve the problem at hand, put out that fire if you will. Okay, so I got to ask you a question on how do people protect themselves? Because we, we know Michael Turpin's doing a fireside chat. It's well known that he sued AT&T. He had his phone SIM swapped out. This is a known vector in the crypto community. Most people maybe in the mainstream might not know it, but you know, your phone can be hacked. Yes. Simple two-factor yes. authentication is not enough. Correct. What is the state-of-the-art uh, solution for people who want to hold crypto? I any meaningful amount, it could be you know, casual money to you know, high net worth individual who wants to have a lot of crypto. I mean, I spent a good amount of my time talking about custody. Uh, we've sort of pivoted off to a, a, a new part of our business line that deals specifically around institutional custody solutions and, and helping people get through this particular process. But we, we all know, especially from that particular case, that SMS uh, compromises, you know, after account takeover of a, a phone is, is high. Um, you know, hardware tokens are, are always going to be something that I'm going to I'm going to harp, or you know, a YubiKey or something like that, where I'm still having the ability to keep a remote adversary away from being able to um, attack my system that has my private keys or, or whatever uh, high value data I have on it. But if I think about it, at the end of the day. I'm going to need to transfer that risk. You know, I'm, I, I would like to say that we could transfer all risk, but instead, for the people that have a lot of crypto, you're going to need to look for a good custody solution. You're going to need to look and trust the team. You're going to need to look and trust the technology that they have. And you're going to have to get insurance, you know, because there are so many vectors in. And at a certain point in time, you, we, we can't go back to the Wild West. The insider where job is, is really popular now too. It, it is, and, and, but there are ways around the collusion, counterparty, third party risk of ensuring that not one person can you know, take yeah. the, the billion dollars worth of crypto and, and run away off to Venezuela and never appear again. <laughs> um, but you know, again, it comes down to basic hygiene. I asked people, I, I've surveyed hundreds of, of people in the crypto space, and I asked simple questions like VPNs, and I'm still getting you know, a third to a half of people are using VPNs. You know, very simple things that people are not doing. Um, when you look at passwords, for example, if anyone still has a password under 12 characters, then game over. I mean, you know, there are a variety of ways of hack hacking them. I can use you know, GPU servers to do them very quickly. Uh, I won't go into all the different options that are there. So People 12 still, characters, alphanumeric obviously with- uh, With special characters special as well. Characters. Um, but the assumption, uh, let's just make the assumption uh, that either those passwords have been cracked already, because they've already been dumped. People share passwords, they get used again. Um, and then the entropy is exponentially higher with every single character after 12. 
So, you know, my password's 22 characters. Sure, it's a pain to type it in. But when you think about it at the end of the day, when I combine that with the password manager, that also is a UB key that's a hardware token, yep. and I require that access all the time, then I don't run into the problem that someone's going to compromise a single system yeah, yeah. to get into multiple systems. And then also, also you know, I interviewed a lot of Google people as well, they're looking at security at the hardware level down to the firmware. Sure. Sure. All, all kinds I mean, obviously, of you know, if you can use the TPM chip as well, and you know, you, that, that, that's something that we should be, you know, better at as a society. So while I got you here, I might as well ask you about the China um, Supermicro Mod Chip uh, Base Board Management Controller (BMC) um, that was reported on Bloomberg. Sure. Debunked. Apple and, and uh, Amazon both came out and said, "No, uh, that's been confirmed." They shift their story a little bit to the reality. Probably there is some mods going on. It's manufactured in China. I mean, it's a zero margin business going to zero. Why not just let the Chinese continue to develop and have a higher value security solution somewhere else? That's what some people are discussing, like okay, like the DRAM market was. Yep. Let the Japanese own that, they did. And then Intel makes the Pentium. Uh, Wall Street Journal reported that, Andy Kessler. So, the shifts in the industry, certainly China's manufacturing the devices. Yeah. There's no surprise when you go to China and you're, if you turn on your iPhone, it says Apple would like to push an update, but that's not Apple. It's a forged certificate, and pretty much public knowledge. The DNS is controlled by China, and a certificate. These are things that they can control. That's, this is the new normal. It, so, it, if you it, know the hardware, you can exploit it. We've been dealing with supply chain issues since Mac store hard drives in <laughs> Indonesia. So, you know, was I shocked when I hear stories about that? No, I'm, I'm, you know, sort of scared myself into a corner working in skiffs over the years and reading the, yeah. the various reports that come out about supply chain Certainly poisoning. Certainly possible. Um, it's happening. I mean, it's just to, to what extent is still something that, you know, may or may not be known to its full extent, but it's something that will happen, always happens, and will continue to happen. And so at a certain point in time, Capitalism does step in mm -hmm. and says, "All right, well, guess what? You know, China. You, you know, you're the way I th the way I see it is, China wants to be a superpower. At a certain point, they know that people are looking at them and saying, we 'We can't trust you.' So they're going to clean up their their house just like anyone else. Um, it's but inevitable. It, it is inevitable. Yeah. Because they need to actually show that they can be a trusting force in yeah. in the world economy. And on, at, at the same time, we're going to have competition out there that's essentially going to say." all right, we can actually prove to have a much better, stronger, yeah. validated supply chain that you'll use. I mean, digital. IOT and blockchain, great solutions for supply chain. 100%. I mean, so this is I where mean, we're... we're, we're talking, I mean, I was actually on a plane flying from Phoenix to Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I was sitting next to a guy who was just like, I just want to use the blockchain to be able to deal with um, uh, uh, supply chain around uh, compromised food. So in the sense that if you think about it, fish, for example, um, there's a lot of you know, uh, fake fish, fake type of tuna and other stuff that's out there that people you know, don't know the difference. But the restaurants are paying double, triple the amount of money for it. You start taking things like elephant tusks, you take things like, you know, yeah. just being able to track things that no one's really thinking about and you're just like, huh, I never thought that's of it that way. So at the end of the day, I, I still get surprised with what people are thinking about that they can do with the blockchain. So Andre, question for you here, this event, what's the impact of this event in for the industry in your opinion? Obviously a lot of smart people here talking candidly, sometimes maybe a little bit contentious about philosophies, regulation, no regulation, self-governance, a lot of different things being discussed as an exploration uh, uh, to, to a new proficiency level that we need to get to. What are some of the hallway conversations you're hearing and, and involved in? <laughs> a lot of mine are, are obviously around custody. That is, that is the topic of the moment. Um, and for me, I'm in, I'm in learning mode. I, I recognize that I've spent a lot of time in cybersecurity. However, uh, as it relates to the, the blockchain and digital asset custody, whether it's uh, utility tokens or security tokens, um, I'm, I'm on the CFTC Technology Advisory Committee. Uh, specifically with cybersecurity and custody, and so I want to take in as much information as I can, bring yeah. it back to the committee, bring it back to the commissioners, and help them create the proper regulations and standards, whether it's through an SRO or through the government itself. For the folks that may watch this video later that are new to the area, what does custody actually mean, obviously holding crypto, but to find custody in the in context of these conversations, what's the, what, what's, what's it, what is it, what's the threshold issues that are being discussed? Sure, uh, I mean, to, to break it down, custody is very similar to a bank. So you are, you're saying, I have a lot of X. It could be 
you know, baseball cards, it could be gold bars, it could be, you know, fiat cash. And I want to have someone hold it and I'm going to trust them with that. Of course, I'm transferring that risk and with that I have an expectation as a qualified, to have a qualified custodian that has rules and regulations of how they're going to actually manage it, how they're going to control it, ensure that the risk that people aren't going to take it. It could be, again, the Monet, it could be the Johnny Bench rookie card, it could be, you know, 100 million blocks of gold. But I, I also want to have a level of insurance. That insurance could come from the insurance industry themselves and allowing me to protect it in case something does happen to that. Or the government, you know, FDIC, you know, $250,000 for your bank account is a type of insurance that people are using. Uh, but at the end of the day, from an institutional perspective, you want a pure custodian that takes all the risk. Um, the government wants to say at a certain point that that custodian can allow for a margin call so that the, the client can't come in and say, well, I'm not going to pay out $100 million worth of, of crypto and I'm going to seize, or, or, or seizure of, of funds as well. And um, you know, that's what's being set up right now. Traditional banks are not ready to handle that. Uh, traditional auditing firms like PwC and Ernst Young are still trying to figure out how yeah. they'd even be a, uh, give a qualified opinion as it relates to how you so know. So it's crypto not so much that they are not have the appetite to do it. They don't have systems. They don't have expertise. They don't have systems. They don't, they don't have, have expertise. Workflows. And and right now things are so new and so volatile that they're they're sort of almost putting their toe in the water, yeah. but really not sure what the temperature yeah. is yet of the water and to hop if in. If someone wants to go to court, you say, hey, prove it. Well, it's encrypted. <laughs> I don't know who did it. Well, and the thing is, is that uh, the, uh, when you have 53 states and territories with different money transmitting laws uh, on top of the countless federal agencies and departments that are managing that, it is hard to come to consensus. It is much easier at a, in a place like Bermuda, where you know, the government is small enough where everyone can get together pretty quickly, mm -hmm. have consensus on an opinion of how they want to deal with the crypto market, deal with custody, uh, pass a regulation. And what's nice about Bermuda, it has you know, crown ascendancy, so yeah. the, the UK government still And they move it. fast on the regulation side. They, 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 they literally just passed. They are the only um, jurisdiction that has a, a fully complete law surrounding crypto uh, currency. You're bullish on Bermuda. I am, yeah. because I, I saw the efficiency there. And I, I expressed my same uh, opinion with the CFTC when I was doing my hearing last week, that you know, it's nice to see the speed, but it's also you know, a small island that allows for that speed. And they, and, have, and they have legitimate practices that have been going on for years in other industries. Right, so there's, so, no, there's no dirty money, there's no anything that, that people are sort of concerned with, they have the same AML, KYC, anti-money laundering, and, and know, your, know your customer regulations yeah. that you would expect if you had your money in the United States. Yeah, we had a chance to interview the honorable um, charge there. Um, uh, Premier Burt? The, yeah, oh, yeah very nice. it was great, and uh, with Toronto, so it was awesome. Nice. All right, so final takeaway for this show here, what's your, what's your takeaway about this event, the impact of the industry? Uh, this is a very important event because I think people are still trying to get their footing around blockchain, they're still trying to get their footing around digital asset uh, protections, and you know, if we can get the smart people in one room, uh, and yeah. they can share knowledge, and then we can come together as a community yeah. and create some standards that make sense, then we're protecting the world. Well, Andre, I'm glad you're in the industry because your expertise and background on the commercial side and government side certainly lend well to the needs, <laughs> <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> hey, we need you, yeah. we need more of you. <laughs> Thanks for coming on theCUBE, really appreciate hey, you, your you. commentary and your insight. So CUBE, bring in the insights here. We are live in Las Vegas for HoshoCon. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE. We'll be back with more coverage after this short break. Thank you.